Hi folks, welcome back to the Tabletop Sage. Today we have the first video in a new series for the channel. And if you haven't been able to guess by the title of the video, nor from what you see before you, the series is going to feature World in Flames along with Days of Decision. Now I've had several viewers ask if I could put some Days of Decision content up on the channel, and I've been wanting to do this for quite a while. The trick was in trying to decide what the best format for the Days of Decision coverage uh, should be. I want to find something that's going to be the most informative, interesting, and, uh, and entertaining for you. And uh, the answer was kind of complicated by two main issues. First, Days of Decision was designed to be uh, played both as a standalone game as well as in combination with World in Flames. And as such, I thought uh, tutorial series may not be the, uh, the most helpful. Uh, while it's certainly possible to play Days of Decision as a standalone game, I'm willing to wager that uh, the majority, probably the vast majority of Days of Decision games that have been played have been played in combination with World in Flames rather than standalone games. So I think that um, if you're or if you are a World in Flames fan and you have an opportunity to play Days of Decision, you are not going to uh, pass up the chance to play a combined game uh, with both of them. Also, there are some rule changes uh, to Days of Decision based on whether you're playing the standalone version or the uh, combined version. And so any tutorial I feel would be uh, somewhat incomplete and, and a little lacking. Now, I could have done a just a straight review of Days of Decision, but again, uh, there are some, some concepts and some uh, game mechanisms that I think are better understood uh, when you see them actually in action rather than having them explained to you. And I don't know necessarily that uh, just a straight up review of Days of Decision would be uh, all that helpful to those of you who are interested in it. And so that kind of left me with the playthrough option. And I think this will ultimately work out. Um, this will give all of you an opportunity to see exactly how Days of Decision integrates with World in Flames. I plan on doing a uh, fairly detailed uh, playthrough like you've seen in some of the other series, both with the earlier World in Flames uh, playthrough as well as uh, my last Blitzkrieg playthrough. And so in the course of that playthrough, uh, you should hopefully get the information you would get out of a just a straight tutorial, as well as uh, some of my opinions that you would be getting out of a out of a review. So I think that the playthrough sort of um, is the best of, of all worlds. But there is a second issue that has been complicating even that decision, and that is the fact that there is, as of September 2022, no official version of Days of Decision that is compatible with World in Flames Collector's Edition. Now, as you can see from the box cover here, Days of Decision has had three editions over its history, in, in addition to a reprint of Days of Decision 3. The latest of those was released in 2007, a full decade before uh, the Collector's Edition was available. And so Days of Decision 3 is compatible with World in Flames Final Edition, which was the edition that preceded the Collector's Edition, and Days of Decision 1 and 2 were both compatible with World in Flames 5th Edition. Now, I didn't want to uh, just do a Days of Decision 3 and World in Flames Final Edition playthrough because, again, Collector's Edition is the current edition of the game, while they are... Uh, similar in many ways, there are some distinct differences uh, both to force pools and the map as well as, uh, as the rules. And anybody who is just coming to World in Flames now is most likely going to do so via the Collector's Edition since it's still in print and uh, is uh, readily available. So what to do? Well, fortunately, uh, a few years back, uh, someone posted to the Days of Decision page on BoardGameGeek a, um, a consolidated rules update for Days of Decision 3 that makes it compatible with the Collector's Edition. And that's found in the Files section of that page. I'll, I'll post a link to that uh, in the description below. 
So what we're going to do is use this, um, this rules update uh, that I've downloaded off of BGG and play that in conjunction with the collector's edition. Now, this is something that I think uh, folks out there watching this, if they are interested in doing this, it's something that's certainly within um, the realm of possibility for them. Now, one thing about the rules update from BGG, you are still going to need a physical copy of Days of Decision 3 because the uh, the package, if you will, on BGG that you can download contains only the, uh, the rules updates and updated political options. There are some physical components from the boxed uh, version of the game that you are going to need in order to do this. Now, fortunately, Days of Decision 3 is still um, fairly easy to find on the secondary market with a quick Google search on sites like eBay or even uh, BGG Marketplace, you should be able to get a uh, copy of uh, Days of Decision 3 for a reasonable price if this is a path you wanna pursue. So that's what we will be doing here in this series. And uh, with the kind of introduction out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And I think I'm going to start with just a brief uh, history of Days of Decision itself uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the with the game at this point. Days of Decision first appeared back in 1990 when WIF 5th edition was the current edition of the game. And DOD covered the uh, pre-war period from 1936 up to the outbreak of, uh, of the general war. And it introduced a uh, political system to World in Flames. Now the core mechanics of um, of that political system are still intact actually through this latest version of Days of Decision, even though the game itself has had some, uh, some major changes introduced to it as we will see here momentarily. Uh, but basically it consisted of adding a political phase to the start of each Wolden Flames turn, wherein both sides would select various political options uh, to try to implement. And these range the gamut from uh, gearing up your production multiple levels to uh, the, trying to Anschluss with Austria, uh, Stalin's purges, uh, completing the Maginot Alliance, and so on and so forth. And Days of Decision 1 would be played using the WIF counters and a couple of uh, displays and maps that came with Days of Decision to track the, uh, the political situation because each of the political options that the sides were choosing would have an impact on one or more of the minor countries. And so those minor countries would move uh, either towards or away from the spheres of influence of either the Axis or the Allies. Now I've played oh, several combined games of uh, DoD 1 and uh, WIF 5, and they were just an absolute blast. The, um, the upshot really of Days of Decision in its first incarnation was almost like a, um, a detailed random scenario generator because what would happen is as soon as uh, the general war uh, broke out and that was defined basically as Germany uh, going to war with either the Soviet Union or, uh, or the Commonwealth in France, uh, Days of Decision 1, you would mark out or record the final political alignment of the various minor countries and then you would basically pack up Days of Decision and you were done with that and you were then continuing with just a, a purely uh, fifth edition whiff game. Uh, so what it in effect was doing was was varying the uh, the start date of the uh, of the uh, global war scenario as well as the starting uh, game state. Now in 1994, a second edition of Days of Decision was published, and this made some major changes to the uh, to the previous edition. First and probably most obviously is that. Whereas Days of Decision 1 uh, kept the kind of the bilateral nature of 5th uh, edition World in Flames where you had the Axis versus the Allies, now Days of Decision 2 turned it into a three-way struggle between the ideologies of communism, fascism, and democracy. So the eight major powers were divided up amongst these three um, ideologies and the game no longer wrapped up when general war broke out because there was no longer such a thing as the general war. 
now major powers could go to war with one another. Uh, multiple major powers could be at war with other major powers while uh, yet more major powers remained on the sidelines. In fact, it was even possible for you to surrender and end a war that had started and then at some point later on down the road uh, end up declaring war on the enemy that you had surrendered to a couple of years previously. It really sort of took with from being a uh, uh, an historical World War II game into much more of, a, of an open sandbox game. Uh, the closest thing I can uh, think of would be uh, Empires in Arms, also designed by Harry Rowland. So what Empires in Arms did for the Napoleonic era, Days of Decision 2 and WIF now did for the 1930s and 40s. And it was really kind of a... Um, uh, completely new experience for uh, for WIF players. Now, shortly thereafter, in 1996, World in Flames Final Edition was released, and Final Edition was a major overhaul from 5th Edition. And it had new maps, it had new counters, new rules, and as such, Days of Decision 2 was no longer compatible with Final Edition. So, to remedy that, Days of Decision 3 uh, was released in 2000. And it was actually kind of a good thing. Now, Days of Decision 3 is almost identical to Days of Decision 2. Uh, there are just a few uh, kind of cosmetic changes uh, that were needed in order to make it compatible with Final Edition um, and some cleanup of the rules which, which were needed. The, the, the DoD 2 rules, uh, it kind of felt a little rushed and you know, you look at it being released in 94 with Final Edition, a major overhaul of the entire WIF system following, you know, two years later, uh, the, the rule book for DoD2 leaves a lot to be desired. So they fixed, uh, they fixed most of that with uh, DoD3. Uh, for instance, one of the big changes was 5th uh, Edition WIF used a six-sided die. Now when Final Edition came out, you were using a 10-sided die. So obviously uh, the... Um, the DoD 2 based on the uh, the six-sided die was not going to work with this new uh, ten-sided uh, final edition model as well as the maps being um, completely changed for final edition. Now by 2007 uh, final edition ironically had been uh, getting little rules tweaks continuously uh, basically almost from the day it was published and so the Final Edition game kits that were being uh, published and released in 2007 and 2008 were coming out with a, uh, a slightly different rule book than, uh, than the older previous versions of the Final Edition. And so I think they took that opportunity to do the same and do a reprint of uh, DoD 3 with a rule book that was kind of cleaned up and um, uh, incorporated some of the uh, some of the, the changes that they've been making to Final Edition along the way. And that's basically where DoD's evolution kind of stopped. Fast forward about 10 years to 2017 and the collector's edition being released. And again, uh, in those intervening 10 years, ADG went back and they, uh, they looked at the final edition rules. They've made some changes to that. They tweaked the maps a bit. They've changed the uh, force pools as well. And the result is a very, very nice uh, collector's edition. But to date, they have not done anything regarding Days of Decision. Now, will that change and there'll be a Days of Decision 4 released sometime in the future? Perhaps, but as of now, I haven't heard any, um, any rumors to, uh, to that effect that something's going to be coming out. So fortunately, the uh, some enterprising fan uh, has managed to put together a uh, a reasonably coherent set of rules updating DoD three to match uh, the collector's edition, and we'll talk about some of that and take a look at that. As a matter of fact, what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you uh, some of the physical components of Days of Decision three that we are going to be using in this combined playthrough and actually a couple of um, uh, components that we won't be using. So let's actually get to the table and uh, take a look and see what uh, see what this is all about. 
Now here it is laid out on the tabletop, and for those of you that have seen some of my other WIF videos, uh, a lot of this will look familiar to you. Uh, we start out here at the far end of the table. We have our task force display, then our Pacific and Asian maps. And as we continue moving down, you see we have both of our European maps, the Scandinavian map up there. Uh, we've got our dice tray here in the corner, and then the America's mini map. Next to that is our production display. And this is where we're going to find the first uh, little change uh, when we're playing this combined Days of Decision with game. Uh, we are not going to be using the Impulse Track nor the Initiative Track, we, and I'll show you why in a moment. Uh, so what I've done, um, the unfortunately, the areas that they've allocated for these four pools, this is the Construction Pool, Repair Pool, Reserve Pool, and Lend-Lease Pool, are woefully inadequate for... Uh, for a large scenario. So what I've decided to do is take all of the stuff except for uh, the reserve aircraft, and those would be aircraft units that the major power simply does not have a pilot uh, assigned to. I'm going to leave those aircraft here in the reserve pool. All of the other reserve units, which would be your city-based volunteers, anything labeled reserve, the units uh, that you get upon uh, the major power going to war, I'm going to keep them sort of in this upper quadrant of this display uh, because we won't be using those tracks. Now these two red units you see here are Ethiopian units. Italy begins the game at war with Ethiopia, and these units are eligible to be built by Ethiopia, assuming the uh, war drags on uh, long enough. So this is also going to serve as a, sort of an ad hoc Ethiopian uh, force pool. Now, moving over, you can see we've got, uh, before we go, we have our uh, standard force pool cups. These are the force pools for all eight of the major powers. We've got a couple spare cups and uh, for randomizing things and whatnot. And here we have our first Days of Decision, uh, the first of two major displays that come with Days of Decision and uh, one that you will need if you're going to play a combined game. It's split into two halves and we're going to take a look at this near half first. You can see it's dominated by this giant hexagon shaped display within which there are numerous little hexes and we have flag counters representing the eight major powers and 28 or 29 minor countries. You can see the colored areas are the locations of the three ideologies. Each of the ideologies is broken down into three factions. So for instance in the fascist ideology we have paternal monarchist which is comprised of this outer light gray band we have then authoritarian faction which is a darker gray and then almost a pure black dictatorship um, in the center of it and it's the same for the other two ideologies faction doesn't play a a huge role other than uh, in determining priority for uh, political control of miners. And we'll talk about more of that in more detail once we get into the game, and you'll see uh, kind of how that works. But for right now, we've got the uh, markers for the three uh, fascist countries here. We have the one communist, and then we have one, two, three, four uh, democratic major powers. Most of the minor countries are starting out here in, uh, in the uh, true neutral position at the center of the display. What's going to happen as the major powers play various political options, it's going to have an impact on some of the minor countries, and it's either going to influence them to move towards the major power and its ideology or away from it. So we will be seeing this display quite a bit over the course of the game as these uh, markers begin to move across the, uh, uh, the display. Ideally, if you can get a minor country to be stacked in the same hex as your major power, it would allow you the fullest control over the minor, basically the equivalent of aligning the minor in, uh, in a WIF standalone game. But again, we'll see how this works uh, as part of the playthrough. Now in the upper left hand quadrant, you can see a new impulse track. It has twice as many boxes as the standard WIF impulse track. And that's because Days of Decision has turned the game into a three-sided affair instead of just a two-sided affair. And this impulse marker is going to move up after each player turn. So it's going to be moving up uh, after three player turns rather than just two. And in order to make sure that, you, that each 
faction still has an appropriate number of impulses in a turn. They've had to add extra boxes as well as changing the uh, end of turn uh, number within those boxes. Then below that we'll see a new ideological initiative. And this looks very similar to the standard WIF one, except there's no minus two box. And we have, instead of two markers, we have three markers, one for each of the ideologies. Below the ideological track is the money track. This is where we're going to track the money that the various major powers have. Now, in Days of Decision and uh, with Combined Game, money and build points are the exact same thing, completely interchangeable. So when we talk about a country having 19 build points, it's the same as saying it's got 19 money. We will track, uh, keep track of what they have here, uh, which of course means you will see countries will be saving build points frequently. And you're going to have to spend build points not only to build units, but also to bid for political initiative, which I'll talk a little bit about here in a moment, as well as paying for various political options. Most of the political options have a monetary cost in order to, uh, to execute them. Now, one thing Days of Decision introduces that WIF did not have is deficit spending. Each of the major powers has a credit limit, and you can see down here, China and Russia, it's 10. France, Italy, Japan is 15. Germany, Commonwealth is 20. And USA is 30. This will allow the major powers to actually spend into the negatives and carry a negative balance so long as they don't exceed that credit limit. However, there is a political option that someone can play, which basically, uh, I think it's called the credit card, where countries that are carrying a positive balance will actually gain money from interest and major powers that are carrying a negative balance will have to pay interest and end up going deeper in debt when that option is played. So uh, generally speaking, you tr would like to try to stay on the positive side here, but in certain circumstances, you may be forced to through an emergency to kind of spend into your, uh, into your deficit, towards your deficit limit. And we're going to track that here. Uh, we have a couple of little reminders here about minor activation. And then on the right side, you can see there are a couple of boxes. We have one for it, Japan, Italy, China, and the United States. The other four major powers, that would be Commonwealth, France, Germany, and the Soviet Union, are eligible to control any minor. These four major powers are not. They can only control the minor countries that are listed within the box here. And it's also going to be shown on the country-specific play aids that, uh, that I'll show you later uh, that uh, are part of the uh, BGG download. Now, next to the U.S. and China boxes up here, you see a box labeled League Counselors. Days of Decision includes uh, a League of Nations. And major powers can join the League of Nations, leave the League of Nations. They can also uh, attempt to uh, sanction another major power that happens to be at war with a minor country. But in order to levy those sanctions, they have to pass a vote. All of the eligible major powers will cast their vote, and then you will roll a die to determine which group of six uh, minor countries will also vote. And this is where having political control of a minor uh, country is important because the major power will cast the vote for any minor countries that they control. Now, below that is a coup table for resolving coup cells in, uh, uh, in various minor countries. We have a war with Democrat. This, this is a, um, an effect on U.S. entry when a major power is at war with a Democrat for a certain number of uh, turns. And then if I can get the glare out of the way, maybe, here we go, you can see we have a civil war table. This simply determines the initial split between government and rebel uh, units whenever a civil war breaks out in a minor country. And then finally, we have the weather table down here, which we are not going to use because we will be using the weather table in the uh, WIF uh, collector's edition charts. Uh, here's the other half of this status display, and you can see on both sides we have these blue card-looking uh, things, which are the international political options. There are 20 of them, although with the BGG update there are 21, I believe, international political options. These are the generic options that are available to all of the major powers to play. 
And uh, we'll get into these, in, like I said, in the course of the game. I don't want to spend too much time on them now. But uh, of note uh, on this half are these two tracks. This first track is the political effectiveness uh, track where the major powers political effectiveness will go up and down. Now, the higher your political effectiveness, the greater the chances of your political options being successful when you try to play them. So you're going to want to try to move your, uh, your marker up this track. Next to it is the political initiative track. This is a separate initiative from the WIF initiative. Now the WIF initiative is going to be used uh, when we are doing the WIF portion of the turn, when we are moving and fighting units on the maps. But during the political phase, this political initiative determines the order in which the major powers may attempt to uh, uh, choose and resolve their political options. We've got Germany in the first position to start the game, Italy, CW, and so on, going down to China. You see a couple of last card markers here. Um, in order to attempt to play a political option, you're going to have to bid money, and the order of uh, your political initiative is going to be based on whoever has the highest bid uh, in terms of money, plus this modifier based on your position from the previous uh, turn. There are also a couple of other uh, modifiers down here. It will, again, we'll see how this works uh, in, uh, in the course of play. The first turn, there, there is no bidding. The uh, order is set for the January, February 36 turn. So on this half of the display, we really won't be doing too much with the IPOs on either side, but we will be seeing these two tracks in the middle quite a bit. I'm going to skip over these displays for a moment because I want to uh, show you this political map here. This is the other, the second big display or map that comes with Days of Decision. And as you can see, it shows the entire world here. And it's got the country boundaries as well as showing the location of all of the factories, both red and blue, as well as your resources. And then it has tracks to record the production multiples for the various major powers. This display is not uh, necessary if you're playing the combined game like I am. However, this is absolutely necessary if you're going to play Days of Decision as a standalone game. I have opted not to use this, uh, but I did want to show it to you um, just to give you an idea of what comes in Days of Decision. There's really, there's not a whole lot other than the rules, the two big displays we saw, and a number of these uh, political control markers and the flag markers over here for the status display. That's about all you get with um, Days of Decision. They do have some generic army point and navy point um, markers as well. Now, the reason I'm not using this is because I'm going to be using the, uh, the main width maps and these displays over here to the right. So let's take a look at those real quick, but I'll give you one little last look here at the, uh, at the political map of Days of uh, Decision. You know, it's a nice map. It's pretty well done. I appreciate the, uh, the inset that is kind of zoomed in on uh, Europe, but I do think it's a little busy and it can be hard to see the markers on uh, this kind of colorful, uh, busy background which is why we're going to use the, uh, the displays I'm about to show you. The first of those displays I've uh, simply downloaded and printed out from the internet on some cardstock, and as you can see, it's the production multiples. All of the uh, major power production multiple tracks that are located on the political map have been duplicated on this uh, smaller, more compact display. I also think it's a lot easier and clearer to read than, uh, than this one. So. We'll be using this, and you can see as you uh, conduct your gear ups, you will be moving your uh, marker across the track to record your, uh, your current production multiple for production purposes. Now to the right of that, we have two displays here, and these displays list all of the minor countries that are represented on the status display here, and that contain red factories and resources, and you can see that uh, uh, all of the factories or a factory or a resource occupies one of the boxes here next to the country's row. When you sign economic agreements with minor countries, you'll be placing one of your control markers in that box to reflect uh, which major power uh, has dibs on that, uh, on that resource or factory. 
And as you can see at start, there are a couple, I believe, uh, economic agreements in place. For instance, I think Sweden down here is uh, is giving one of its resources. Yeah, you can see right here where it says resource GE that indicates this resource is going to Germany. So I do need to place a German marker here to reflect that. To the left, we have these three columns. The first two columns are for the alliances that the minor country may have. Each minor country can have up to two alliances, and both of those alliances can be with the same major power. For instance, here you see we have Austria has an alliance with Italy, Czech, uh, Belgium has one with France, as does Czechoslovakia, and then Hungary has an alliance with Italy. I'll skip this for a moment, we'll come back to it. Poland has two alliances, one with France and one with Germany. Portugal has an alliance with the Commonwealth. This is Romania has an alliance with France. And finally, Yugoslavia has an alliance with the Soviet Union and France. The third column here is the guarantees column. And at the start of the game, the only minor country that is guaranteed by any of the major powers is the Netherlands, which is guaranteed by the Commonwealth. Now, if you wish to sign an alliance with a minor country that already has two alliances, the first thing you're going to have to do is attempt to break one of those alliances. And then if you're successful, uh, subsequently you can then try to uh, sign an alliance with said minor on a future turn. So we're going to be tracking uh, economic agreements, alliances, and guarantees for the uh, minor countries on these two displays here, rather than uh, tracking them over here on the political display. And that's pretty much it for the uh, setup of the game. There is one more thing uh, I'd like to uh, show you in this intro video before we wrap it up for today, and that is the consolidated rules and charts that uh, are in the BGG download. So let's take a look at those real quick. Now, in addition to a set of rules that will update the DoD rulebook to the collector's edition, the BGG package also has uh, all of the options, both the international political options and the individual major power political options, sort of condensed um, with the applicable rules uh, right there on the cards. And you can see here, I've gone ahead and printed out the international political options, the IPOs, onto uh, just some white cardstock here. And I'll show you sort of how they do this. So we have the uh, the IPO number and name up top here. A couple of lines here for any prerequisites and uh, modifiers for uh, minor country effects. This pink box here tells you what the cost is uh, in uh, money. And then we have a U.S. entry section. And then down here, this main section is basically all of the rules that are going to apply to that particular option, which really saves you from having to reference the rule book at all. They're very well done. You can see this first one, IPO number one, new order. This is basically moved. Uh, this is used to move your uh, major powers uh, political marker around the status display. Now, I'm not going to be playing with the optional rule that allows uh, major powers to leave their ideology, uh, but you can still move around a little bit uh, from faction to faction within that ideology, even without the uh, without the. Um, uh, optional rule. So you can see here uh, we have uh, IPO2 minor economic agreement. This is how you uh, form economic agreements to get the use of resources or factories from minor countries. You can see there's some prerequisites here. Uh, the um, uh, modifiers in this case are going to apply to the specified minor country and if you sign it a plus one will uh, draw them closer to you. If you uh, are breaking that minor agreement, it's going to be a minus one, which is going to push them uh, away from you. And then we have the U.S. entry effects based on uh, year, and then again, the uh, text of the rules applying to this particular option. I'm not going to go through all of the uh, all of the options at this point in time. Uh, I'll delve into each one in greater detail as they come up in the course of play, but I did want to show you sort of what it looks like from the uh, download here, and they've got uh, 21 IPOs now in the system, uh, which includes, I think, some of the newer options that were included in the 2008 uh, World and Flames Annual. Now, in addition to the IPOs, the, the download also has put together uh, some charts for each specific major power. 
Now what I've done is I've just gone ahead and printed those country specific charts out on different colored cardstock to help keep them organized uh, and uh, so I know which charts belong to which major power. And what we're looking at here is uh, is Germany's. Now I'm going to sort of skip these first two pages. We'll come back to this in just a minute, but here are what the um, country specific options look like. So you've got the available options here. This is Germany option 0A. Now option 0 has several variants to it. These are all option 0. Uh, so you have 0A, 0B, 0C, and so on, all the way up through um, uh, option 0L. And again, I'm not going to go through the um, the options in, in any detail uh, right now. We'll, we'll see those later on. Um, here we have German uh, option one, disarmament. Uh, option two, gear up. Uh, this is how you increase your production multiple. Disarmament is how you reduce your production multiple. Uh, option three, treaty. This is uh, all about signing treaties with other major powers. It's war. Option four is how you uh, basically declare war. And then option five is surrender. Now for all of the major powers, they all have the same option zero and uh, one through five. Some of them will have certain uh, differing prerequisites uh, for, uh, for instance, uh, option number four, declaring war. Germany has a little more uh, leeway uh, in declaring war than say the United States does. And this uh, download from G BGG has the specific requirements to Germany or whichever major power it is right there on the card. So these really do eliminate the uh, need to uh, to check the rule book for probably 90, 95% of the um, of the things you would normally be looking in the rule book for. Um, and again, the uh, once we get actually once we get past the first uh, five or six uh, country options that are all the same, now we start to get into the really specific country options. So you see here with Germany, option six is Occupy Rhineland. They've got uh, option seven, Austrian Anschluss, Demand Sudetenland, Czech Rump Occupied, uh, Demand the Danzig Corridor here, uh, Recognize the Ukraine. We've got Create the Waffen SS Corps, Support Hungarian and Bulgarian Land Claims. Then uh, they also have Support Romanian Land Claims, Hitler Assassinated, German advisors recalled, Alsace-Lorraine returned, and Varland returned. And just to point out uh, one little thing here on these country-specific options, the, the IPOs, uh, the international options that are available to everyone, are pretty generic and can be played multiple times over the course of the game. In other words, you can choose the uh, IPO for the minor economic agreement uh, many times um, throughout the course of the game. Some of the country specifics are going to be limited in that they can only be selected once. And you can see here, um, we've got prerequisites for the option. Here's the option number and title. The prerequisites box, modifiers for specific uh, minor countries that are going to be affected by this particular option. The cost in pink here, US entry effect and then the rules on how to um, resolve this option. And then this little box here in the bottom corner says limited, yes or no. And you can see up here, surrender is not limited, whereas occupy the Rhineland is. So essentially you can only occupy the Rhineland once per game. Once this option is played successfully by Germany, it is no longer available to, uh, to Germany to play again, whereas Surrender, you can surrender as many times as you'd like throughout the course of the game, although I don't recommend it. So in addition to the options there, each country also has their own uh, production record here. This is for gearing limit purposes where I'll be recording um, what the builds are for each of the major powers on this sheet uh, specific to the country by class of um, unit. And then we have a, a notes column here for just general notes. And then this options column, this is where I will record which political option has been played um, on each turn as we go down, if any. Now this NT column here with this four in parentheses, this refers to the Naval Treaty value. There's an option which can implement the, uh, I think it's the London Naval Treaty. It is not in effect at the start of the game, but basically if the treaty is, uh, is in effect, every uh, major power except China will have to 
to uh, calculate its naval treaty value each turn. And you do that by counting all of the SCS and CVs that it has on map, and then multiplying that number by the uh, country-specific multiplier, which is the number in parentheses here. So for Germany, she starts out with 10 SCS and CVs on map. We multiply that by her country-specific multiplier of 4 to give us a total naval value of 40. And then where your naval value ranks among the other countries will have an impact on your political effectiveness. That's really all I'm going to say about the Naval Treaty for now. Again, if the Naval Treaty comes into effect during the game, we'll get into uh, more details there. But now I want to go back and take a look at the first two pages that we passed up. These first two pages are uh, really some of the best play aids I've seen for, uh, for this game. They're outstandingly done. And I'll just walk you through here and show you uh, what I'm talking about. So we've got the name of the major power up top here. And the first section here is the setup. This is the setup for the scenario. So you don't even have to reference the scenario book uh, and the chart that they have in there for uh, all the major powers because each major power is going to have all of the information they need right here to conduct setup. Below that is the treaty section. Now this treaty uh, refers to treaties with other major powers. So a treaty is between major powers and alliance is between a major power and a minor country. And you can see we've got the major powers, the other major powers listed here, whether or not it's a member of the Naval Treaty, is it a member of the League of Nations? We also have the credit limit that I mentioned earlier displayed here. The credit limit can potentially change throughout the course of the game based on some political options that are being played. Uh, you see again here the naval multiple that applies to the major power in question, four, which matches what we saw on the build record. And then these three columns here show you uh, level one, level two, and level three. There are up to three levels of treaties that you may be in with uh, any given major power. And this is where you'll record uh, the date at which those treaties were signed and which level you are with which other uh, major power country. Below that is your political effectiveness. This just kind of duplicates the uh, track that we saw on the uh, status display, the political status display uh, with, with DOD. So this is, again, this is redundant. You can use this or not, but you can see here as of January, February 1936, the first turn of 1936, Germany currently has a political effectiveness of five. Below that, we're going to get some uh, information on Germany specifically, you know, which miners they can control all of them, which miners they're aligned with. As you align minor countries to Germany, you can record them on this line here. Then we have a treaty chart and war chart. These are two charts which list all of the countries, both minor and major powers in the game. And some of your political options, rather than giving you a specific effect for a minor, will just tell you to apply the treaty chart or the war chart uh, modifier to the, um, to the minor country. Well, this here means you won't have to go and dig out those particular charts because it's got the information uh, right here for you. At war, this box allows you to record who you, uh, with whom you are currently at war, any conquered major powers or minor countries, directed minor countries. These are um, minor countries that you are controlling the units of uh, that are at war or have been declared war on by another major power but are not necessarily aligned to you or related to you in any uh, particular way. And then below that, controlled territories. Um, we've got the Rhineland, uh, which is part of Germany, but not part of Germany. And we'll, we'll talk about that probably uh, on the very first turn of the game in a little more detail. And then down here, you can see the uh, some of the effects um, for uh, various minor countries uh, with regards to Germany. And then we've got just general notes section here. You can see alliance with Poland. Now on the back side, this is where we have our production information. So we have our production multiple track here showing all of the multiples, uh, all of the possible uh, multiples that Germany uh, could have, including her peacetime maximum here. This again kind of duplicates the uh, information from the production multiple track we saw from uh, the DOD displays. Below that, you have available factories and resources. Now, this is very handy. As you um, control resources, either through minor economic agreements or by outright um, uh, military control of them, you can write the country or territory here, the factories that you're getting from it, as well as your oil and non-oil resources. 
Below that, we have our minor country political control effects. And again, we'll talk about this in greater detail, but these are rules basically telling you what you can and can't do at the various levels of control, depending upon where that country's minor country's political marker is in relation to yours on the uh, display. Down here, we have a place to record all of our lend lease and uh, trade agreements. So you can see here Germany is getting starts off getting one non oil resource from Sweden and one oil resource from Romania at the beginning of the game. They also have a um, I believe they have an economic agreement with Russia. Um, I'll have to check into that in, in which case I'll just be filling in here. But you can see there's a column to record the build points sent to received oil resources as well as non oil resources. And then finally down at the bottom, we've got a space to do your production calculations. So we have the total number of factories controlled by Germany, the number of oil resources, non oil resources, giving you your current production points for this turn multiplied by your current production multiple. That's going to give you your total build points down here whether or not you have any trade agreements and all major powers in days of decision are either protectionist or free traders. In fact, at the start of the game in 1936, the United States is the only free trader and protectionist uh, countries will get a, uh, a bonus uh, production point, not a build point, but a production point uh, each turn for being protectionist. Now, if you are trading with a free trader, you will get to add their production multiple as a um, bonus to your build points. So right now with the United States being the only free trader, uh, you would have to have a, um, an economic agreement with them and a treaty with them. If you have both of those, then uh, you will be able, when it comes to calculating your production, you would be able to add their current production multiple, which is 0 0.05, to your build point total. Now, that's nothing spectacular here uh, in 36, but as the United States gears up, it could uh, be a nice bonus to, uh, to various countries down the road. But everything you need as far as bookkeeping uh, for a game of Days of Decision uh, combined with your World and Flames game is all contained basically right here on these two pages and this build record. With these sheets here, everything you could possibly need to uh, record is uh, is arranged. And this is just one of, like I said, the best play aids I have seen for World and Flames. So uh, kudos to uh, whomever uh, went ahead and put these together because they did an outstanding job. Uh, just to give you a, a little glance at another major powers um, uh, first two pages here, we'll look at the USA. Again, you can see the setup here. We've got our treaty section. They have a, it's a little bit different because again, these are tailor made for each uh, major power. When you download them, all you need to do is print, print them out and you're ready to go. Uh, but we've got a line here for the number of naval units that are in Honolulu. If you are familiar with World in Flames, you'll know that there is a U.S. entry option where the U.S. will relocate the Pacific Fleet to Pearl Harbor. And if they don't have a certain number of naval units in Pearl Harbor, it's much more difficult for them to try to declare war uh, on, uh, on Japan. Well, the same sort of thing exists with Days of Decision. It's modified slightly as uh, as we'll see, but the uh, play aid here does provide a space for you to record uh, the naval units that are in Honolulu. We've got our political effectiveness track. We've got uh, more information about the United States here, uh, as including the list of countries that it can control countries it's aligned with. In this case, it starts out aligned with the Philippines. We've got its treaty and war chart numbers, areas to record uh, with whom it's at war, directed, controlled territories, and flipping over on the back side here, again, we've got production multiple track, available factories, resources, minor controls, um, lend lease and trade agreements, and then a place to calculate our um, production. So that's pretty much it for the intro. I think I've shown you everything that uh, you need to see at this point. Uh, starting uh, with the next episode, we will uh, take a look at the uh, various, I guess, war aims or goals, uh, maybe the strategies that each of the major powers will be pursuing, just to give you a little bit of uh, an orientation as to uh, what uh, the various minor powers or major powers are trying to do in the course of our upcoming game.
And then after that, I think we will be ready to go ahead and dive in and, and uh, start this thing off and let you see what a combined Days of Decision World in Flames Collector's Edition game looks like. Appreciate you uh, watching today. Uh, stay tuned. Till next time, take care, and we'll see you then.